Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Corellis Community Library Author Series. I'd like to acknowledge all of our guests from outside of New Mexico, many of whom were invited by Stephanie Larkin, publisher of Red Penguin Books. And I'd also like to welcome all of our local guests. It is my pleasure to have with us tonight local authors Sandy Hoover and Jim Tritton. Sandy has, been, has written several prize-winning short stories, and Jim is a multi-award winning author with numerous book publications to his name. And tonight, we'll have the pleasure of discussing two of their books, Mirth and Musings and Panama's Gold, A Tale of Greed. Now, Panama's Gold is a first place winner in the 2021 New Mexico Press Women Communications Contest and a second place winner in the 2021 National Federation of Press Women Annual Communications Contest. And I think Jim has the certificate yeah, I'm trying that to, he was going to get it up. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. I, I will get it there eventually. Yes, we it find. never fails. Okay. Why it's am not I... as bad as the other evening when they gave out we're going to give out the awards and have the uh, announcement from an earlier week where they were just telling there were awards. Oh, <laughs> there we go. All right. Now I got it. And I just got to share again. One more time. There we go. Just long enough to say, oh, there they are. There yes, they are. Here are the two uh, certificates that uh, they earned with their writing with these books. Um, Again, the New Mexico Press Women 2021 Communications Contest and the 2021 uh, Communications Contest second place uh, novellas for Panama's Gold. So congratulations and uh, yeah. welcome Sandy and Jim. I'm going to turn it over to you and take it away. Thank you, Sandra. Thank you for inviting us. Um, we're delighted to be part of the Corrales Library Author Series. And good evening, everyone, those of you I know and those who are brand new friends. It's such a pleasure to see you this evening. And now to the matters at hand. Um, in a library, I would say those are books. And in particular, we're going to talk about the couple that were written by Jim and me. Um, our anthology, Mirth and Musings, came about because Red Penguin asked for a book to share our writing with a new audience. Uh, to create a short intro to us with examples of what we write, what we have to say and share meant gathering our stories and that were earlier enjoyed by friends to produce this compilation. Um, all of them have been published before, except the one I'm going to read a little excerpt from, which is called Polished with Love. And <clears throat> This is, a, as I said, a piece that's longer, but we're just going to take a couple minutes out and read some of it. Cora, Elizabeth Hood, Eddie to her family, but Cora or Miss Hood to everyone else was perhaps inordinately proud of being independent. She had completed high school, the first girl in the family to do so, and gone on to secretarial school to guarantee she could make a living. The depression in 1937 while not truly recovered from, was waning. Businesses were hiring, and she found a job as a secretary in an architect's office. There were several singles living in her Dallas boarding house. Most were, like Cora, escapees from rural or semi-rural backgrounds. They were products of straight-laced families, now reveling in their freedom. The girls worked for different companies. There were lots of junior members of firms as a mix and match, for casual outing and dating. They had groups who met for musical evenings in the clubs that opened after prohibition was repealed. They had crowds of friends who met on weekends to play tennis, an increasingly popular sport, or golf, the other excuse for mixed couples to be active together. There were dances and picnics, trips to the country with lots of car caravans and crowds of young 20-somethings enjoying freedoms they had never known before. Cora among them. Imagine them dressed in fashionable clothes, languidly reclining on plaid blankets, perhaps sipping a chilled slow gin poured from a hip flask, sharing hopes for their futures. 
I shan't be a secretary all my career. I desire more than that, Cora said, feeling racy with a cigarette in hand. What do you think you'll do, Mary, a close friend asked, taking her seriously. Perhaps assistant to the partner. I'm a quick study. I'm thinking I'll read and study art and architecture books and be one of those who helps the designers. Cora stopped to drag on her cigarette. Taller than most and opinionated, she seemed a tough nut to most men, but slowly she found a steady bow. Baker Whittington, sturdily built and taller even than Cora, challenged her at tennis, even though she won many of their matches. Keeping their competition even, he was a better golfer than she, but again, they were closely enough matched to keep the outcome in doubt. Cora delighted in having Mary, more like a sister than a friend, in whom to confide her ambitions, her worries, her emotions regarding boyfriends. They were so different in size and style, they felt no rivalry in the age old dance to find a husband. Actually, they told one another, they had no interest in marriage. A love, a lover, now that was something else again. Cora was a head taller than Mary. Mary's small blonde roundness contrasted appealingly with Cora's elegant length of leg. Cora though was stunning in the long slender dresses that had replaced flappers short skirts and she considered slacks a la Catherine Hepburn the next thing. As Baker and Cora chose to be a pair more often, it was assumed by their companions they had an understanding. About this time, Cora was transferred to another city and Cora Baker was transferred to another city and Cora regaled her friends with taker, tales of the letters she received and the plaintive yearning tone in his writing since being away from her. Her response to his absence was to increase her activities with girlfriends, letting the men know she was engaged to Baker and being faithful to him. She took a train trip and when she returned, she told her friends Baker had requested a rendezvous and they met in Chicago, a city big enough and far enough away from home in Dallas so they would be anonymous. Her friends were shocked, titillated and scandalously excited for her. Her reputation as belonging to Baker was solidified as she spent more time alone, ostensibly pining for or writing to him. He says how much he misses me, so I can't not write back, can I? I don't want him waiting and hurting with loneliness or worse yet, finding some floozy to who will comfort him. There's more. <laughs> and now I'm gonna turn it over to Jim, the other half of this writing duo and let him give you a sample from Mirth and Musings as well. Okay, but before I do that, I wanna acknowledge Judy has joined us. And that is my original writing partner from Charles E. Gorton High School in Yonkers, New York, where she and I wrote Harvey's Corner, and we made it all up. Good to see you, Judy. Thank you for joining us. Okay, so my contribution to this reading will be um, Sauna Goose, S-A-U-N-A. -A. You all know what a sauna is but I'll bet none of you, except for Yasmin, know what a sauna goose is. So rather than an essay which explains it, I take the, the reader through the experience of taking this kind of sauna in Denmark, where Yasmin is from. Perspiration rained down my face, burning my eyes as though battered, bathed in acid. The saltiness reminded me of tumbling through ocean waves when I was a kid. Internal pressures forced my mouth open while my stomach wrenched. Starving for oxygen, I inhaled a bushel of oppressive superheated air. My lungs rejected the intake. I coughed and grimaced when bile seared my throat and rose into my nasal passages. I leaned back to stabilize and closed my eyes. My hands found the smooth wooden seat. Involuntary spasms followed at, <clears throat> as my palms and fingertips blistered. The shock stopped my heart. I felt the cold water before my mind registered what was happening. I opened my eyes wide, gasped, and took in another lungful of air while I reacted to the frigid water drenching my near-naked body. 
I roared at the top of my lungs, invoking the name of our Lord and begging for a quick death. I shuddered and collapsed in on myself as the icy fresh water replaced the sweat that soaked the towel cushioning my bony rear end. My mouth gaped open seeking oxygen. I inhaled an even larger mass of still superheated air. The cooling water evaporated in the heat and I felt myself loosen up. I wiped the refreshing liquid from my face, reveled in the rapid change of skin temperature and opened my still stinging eyes to see a shadowy figure with a pail retreat through the open door. I looked up and reflected on what the hell was I doing in that wooden planked room? You'll have to read the rest to see everything you ever wanted to know about a sauna goose. <laughs> And to realize just how close things came to not surviving. <laughs> like something I experienced in tur Turkey one time. You did one of those? In okay. Turkey, yeah, it was not much fun. Okay. All right, so now we're going to switch to our the second book that we're here to talk about tonight, Panama's Gold. And I'm going to start out by reading the, uh, the description of the book from the back cover. Chen Zhou represents his company and a Chinese gang in Panama in 2018. His objective is to secure an economic advantage for his country with raw materials critical to manufacturing smartphones, digital cameras, computer parts, and in the renewable energy technology industry, military equipment also, glass making and metallurgy. Chinese gangs are running investments and in infrastructure development in Panama. Lanny Mitchell, a youthfully retired American environmental lawyer as an antagonist, revisits Panama to test her idea of becoming a resident expat. She unexpectedly encounters ecological issues and the activities of the gangs. A dormant volcano leaks poisonous gases that kill local fowl and threaten humans. Spanish gold and artifacts are linked to events while the Panama Canal was being excavated with hints at government cover-ups explaining yellow fever that had caused massive deaths during the construction. Chinese attempts to capitalize on the opportunity to corner the world's rare earth market are thwarted by Lanny and local Panamanians. They want Panama to retain its ownership of the valuable rare earth and Spanish gold. Chen Zhou meets his fate at the hands of the Chinese gangmaster who does not tolerate failure. Finding the answer to environmental and economic concerns and helping friends drive the action to a surprising finish with enough clues to hint at a follow on adventure. So I will now read a, an excerpt from the middle of this story, Panama's Gold, A Tale of Greed. This is from chapter 31, It's Now or Never. A little bit of a difference in the, from the past two readings. <clears throat> I cannot bring myself to sell the property. It's been in the family since the time of the conquistadores. Lanny jumped to her feet and pumped her clenched right fist. Terrific. What are your plans? What can we do to help? We're in this with you. Waving his arm to calm her down, Bernardo chuckled and asked, and how about the rare earth? Alejandro answered, my advisors tell me that we need to deal with the government and obtain mining permits. They don't think this will be a problem. Once the government understands there's a potential for major economic development, they will delay action until we obtain financial backing for our operations. Bernardo asked, and what about the Chinese? Alejandro looked at the desktop and picked up some documents stapled to a blue cover. Mira, the latest. He handled the papers to Bernardo. Bernardo reviewed each page and then handed them to Lanny. Even better offer than the last time. Lanny put the papers back on the desk and asked, when did you get these? Joe was here about an hour ago. He said it was their final offer. He knows you said no. Yes, when he left here, he clearly understood that the property would only be sold over my dead body. Bernardo added, let's hope it does not come to that. Alejandro beckoned to the door. Lanny, Professor Cruz, let's go out to the area of the old gold mine. I wanna show you something I found yesterday. They went out to the Land Rover and got in. Alejandro turned the starter and stopped when the engine did not catch as expected. And there was a distinct smell of gasoline. What the, Alejandro said. 
He motioned toward the ignition switch, but was interrupted by Bernardo's hand on his arm. Bernardo said, wait, don't try the starter again. Something might catch fire. I smell gasoline, possibly a break in the fuel line. Let's look under the hood. The three of them got out of the vehicle and approached the front. The smell of gasoline was quite pronounced. Alejandro reached for the latch and opened the hood. What is that doing here? Lanny asked. Bernardo glanced as he answered, there is no logical reason for a cardboard box with holes to be in the engine compartment, let alone with fuel injectors fed into the box. Let's get some long handled tools and take it out. End of reading. So, Sandy, why don't you uh, go ahead and read a selection from Panama's Gold. And considering that this happens much earlier in the book, we probably should have done them in the other order. However, you get a taste for both parts of it this time. So it, <clears throat> this is near the beginning and Lanny is about to go a birding. It was still dark at 15 minutes before five in the morning when Lanny got to the front of the hotel and found Alejandro parked in the drive. Buenos dias, Alejandro, how are you this morning? Very good, Senorita Lanny. You are prompt as usual. Are you ready to leave? Well, not quite. I took the liberty of inviting another birder to join us. I was sure you wouldn't mind. However, I told him what time to meet us. And if he isn't here soon, we will go on. His name is Chen Zhou. Alejandro asked, Joe is his first name? Yes, he was trying to find birds without a helpful guide like you. They both turned as they heard footsteps. Here he is a little early as well. Good morning, Joe. This is Alejandro. Alejandro, a pleasure. Beaming at them, Joe said. I understand Lanny has hired you for several days and I would like to join you today. The two men shook hands, finished introductions and settled their business arrangement. Alejandro loaded their belongings into the Land Rover and they departed to find the army ants. Before sunrise at 6 a.m., they followed an old dirt road near some railroad tracks and then took a turn onto a dirt road that circled the base of Volcan de Oro, where they stopped and unloaded equipment and backpacks. Fortunately, it was cool as they traversed the jungle. They followed a barely marked footpath into a heavily wooded, shallow valley, right, winding toward the rising slope of the volcano. Keep your eyes open for flags that will show us where my friend Miguel left the trail and found the ants. He was lucky to find their bivouac so we can see them today. Several yards back, Lanny had stopped to observe a glass-winged butterfly whose erratic flight intrigued her. She caught up to Alejandro and Joe in time to hear Alejandro add, the ants stay in one spot for several days and foraging parties go out each day to catch insects and spiders. They bring their kill back to the bivouac to share with the queen and the rest of the workers. Alejandro pointed to an orange flag on a wire stake. Wire stake. Here's Miguel's marker. Watch where you step. We should be early enough. The ants are still waking up, but you don't want to meet them. Alejandro's voice trailed off as he led them farther into the dense thickets crowding the valley. Look, here's the bivouac. The ants are beginning to move out from their sleeping place. Alejandro gestured toward a dark mass draping over a fallen log and onto an intersecting leaning branch. See, the ants are passing that way. The lead foragers have started and the others are beginning to follow. Pointing, he added, we can go ahead of them and watch the birds come as the ants miss some of the insects. This leaves food for the birds. Paralleling the moving stream, the three hurried to get ahead of the scurrying mass, staying yards away from the increasing parade. Alejandro started calling out names of birds faster than Lanny and Joe could follow. They were dazzled by the number and variety of ant birds. Activity filled the undergrowth and all three were pointing and exclaiming over the different species they were seeing. Lanny stopped to peer at some unusual rocks and a crack in the ground. She bent over and let her binoculars fall to the end of their strap. She shook her head and stood up. What a terrible headache. Oh, I'm feeling nauseated. I guess it's the excitement. Joe and Alejandro were some distance ahead in the jungle, almost out of sight. They were excited spotting still more species and for a moment, Lanny was ignored. She took a deep breath before trying to stand erect without vomiting and was stunned to observe several birds down the gentle slope 
lying on their backs on the ground near her. One was feebly flapping a wing, another's legs were twitching, but several more different species were totally still. Alejandro, please come back. I need some help. And will she get the help she needs? You'll have to read the book to find out. Okay, Sandy, this is a, a that was a perfect segue into uh, uh, how did we come up with this, uh, this book in the first place? Uh, it was an amazing birding trip to Panama. I have fallen in love with that country. I got to spend two plus weeks there chasing birds, following army ants, finding exactly what we describe that happens in this tale um, without the Chinese problem. And it led me to hunt for an excuse to write about it. And at that stage, you know, Jim and I had had several other um, projects together and I thought this might be another one that we could do and he asked what did I want to write about and then we started from there and kept expanding the idea and um, it grew because there have been so many attempts to make something happen across that isthmus that it lends itself to intrigue and different kinds of aspects of chasing things um, and then we had a friend, another yeah. one of his friends. Another one, an Air Force pilot this time, who's an expat that lives in Panama. And uh, he was able to uh, talk with us on a regular basis and give us some ideas. But basically we took the, 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 the initial concept is, she's got a character, Sandy's got a character that she's already written in a previous story, Lanny. It's a good character. And she's gonna come to Panama and she's gonna do some birding. All right. I don't think that was enough for an adventure story. So I, I used the model of the, um, the hero's journey in which you have to overcome an obstacle and another obstacle and another obstacle. And then eventually there's a resolution. Sandy bought into the model. And then it was a matter of trying to figure out, okay, well, what are these obstacles going to be that we're going to create before we have the good ending? And Panama, well, you got you to gotta talk about the canal. If you're going to talk about the isthmus, you're going to talk about the gold that was being transported by the Spanish from one side of the ocean, one ocean to the other. And some of that stuff got raided by pirates and by uh, the British, uh, depending on whether they were privateers or pirates that week. Mm -hmm. And then we got into this whole thing about something that could be worth more than the old gold. And uh, we, we did some research, or, and Bryn helped us uh, with, uh, with the kinds of things that could be in Panama. And if you have dormant volcanoes, that's a wonderful uh, environment to find these rare earths, which are then used in manufacturing. And those are truly more precious than gold. And, they're, and the Chinese are in fact trying to corner the market and the Chinese, as we didn't know at the time, are in Panama and basically running things without, with the government's tacit approval. They're, the Chinese even have uh, their, own, their own armed forces there. They're, they belong to a company, they don't belong to the state, but they have, uh, it's a massive presence. And so picking on the Chinese was quite fortuitous. So well, we, now we worry we, uh, about Chinese gangs. Yeah, and we're and Sandy is going to continue that with her next iteration of the story in Panama, and the Chinese are still in the in the picture. Sandy, yes, they are. Um, part of the the reason for this story is that there is right now worldwide a fungus killing all the amphibians and they have been rescued and they are creating arcs to preserve them until they can get a handle on how to release them into the wild. Uh, poachers want to have mm -hmm. examples of these. The, the people who collect things are crazy and will pay anything for some particular, particular creature. Anyway, so that's a piece of it, but the, the Chinese are still there and the head of the Chinese gang is still being ugly. And so I'm trying to right now figure out how we're going to, how we're going to kill him. <laughs> it needs to be particularly unpleasant because he's been so unpleasant. 
And it's really nice when you can decide that unpleasant people just need to be removed and do it. Um, <laughs> there's that's a one of the benefits to that without getting in trouble. Yeah, that's one of the benefits of writing fiction instead of nonfiction. When yep. you're writing nonfiction, you sort of got to most of the time stick to the truth. Um, you can be somewhat creative, but we have carte blanche. To the, uh, to the best of my knowledge, there is no rare earth in Panama, but there could be because all of the conditions that would be necessary to find it are there. And that just might mean, it can mean one of two things. It could mean that there is none, or it could mean that they're, they haven't found it yet, but right. it's, it is credible. And so that is one of the tests when you're writing fiction is that you don't have, it doesn't have to exactly be true. It could be true. It, it is not something that is, oh no, that's ridiculous. No, this could be true. And the Chinese gangs are true and the birds are true. And Bryn Kalenda was true too. <laughs> so maybe uh -huh. uh, Sandy, we should talk a little bit about working together. No, we seem to be a good partnership. Um, Jim keeps me honest on how male speak works. The, and, cause, and when I write something, he says, no, men wouldn't say that. So um, straightens it out. And on the other hand, I can tell him that we use a bit more prosody as women and it's a, a little less direct and a little more convoluted. And so that works as well. And we have put down ideas and then simple sentences and passed it back and forth until the writing has, we've been told it's seamless that nobody can tell where one author stopped and the other started. So this is the sixth collaboration that we've done and uh, they seem to work well. So. Yeah, I take that as high praise when people read the book and they go, we can't tell who wrote what part. Now, clearly, anything having to do with birds was not written by me, but that's <laughs> well, the original draft. And then as we collaborate, it then changes into not my words, not Sandy's words, but words that we both can agree on and that flow. Similarly for you naval aviators, and let's see, we got one Air Force and we got an Army guy here too. For all you flying guys, there's some great flying scenes in this book. And I had a little bit more to do with those initially. Yeah, I was going you know. to say it's the metal wings go to him. The feathered wings are mine. So <laughs> it works out as an, an, an even distribution. Um, right. But and, I would tend to write those very technically, you know, so that my fellow aviators would, would I'd be using jargon and you can't do that. So the initial drafts would be full of jargon and then sandy would go oh now wait a minute what the hell does that mean you know okay i have to figure out how to describe a very technical scene actually there's about two or three scenes uh, uh chapters in which aviation plays a, a significant role and i had to they had to be rewritten so that anybody who picks it up who's not an aviator or does never flown would be able to generally understand what is happening and I'm going to pick with that because um, as the navigator slash WAFA, the wise ass flight attendant for a small plane that we had for quite a while, I can understand a lot of what's there, but I can still say this isn't going to work for most people. I right. can get it, but it's, it, it doesn't flow even though it's right. Right. So we'd be, we'd be interested to hear uh, from some of the people who have absolutely no aviation experience, whether you thought you were able to follow it. That's, that's a challenge for all writers. And it was a challenge in this as well. And it's a challenge for any kind of writing when you have technical expertise that exceeds what the average reader is going to be able to understand. And you have to be able to describe the things or write it in such a way that the reader doesn't care exactly. For example, all of those wonderful sailing ship, uh, Napoleonic era sailing ship uh, stories uh, that, that are written and you, you have people climbing and hoisting and pulling and you know, at some point it doesn't matter what the name of the rope is and what the name of the yarn is. I, I just, okay, they're up there, they're doing stuff. But we, we had, a, a, I think a, a little bit more, uh, success in writing it so that I believe nobody will be, nobody should 
blow it off and just go, I don't understand that. No, I think you should be able to understand it the way it was all written. But Sandy raises a good point about the complementary aspects of writing. Uh, you want to talk a little bit about uh, that, Sandy, pantsing versus plotting? <laughs> I think Jim, if left to himself, would broaden his outlines to the point where all he had to do was add conjunctive pieces to it, and he'd have a complete book. And I'm at quite, if not the opposite end, just close to, we have the, <clears throat> the idea of organization versus let's turn the characters loose and see where they walk off the page and they will chase them. And so there's this thing of, of trapping them to some degree and figuring out where the story is going to go and trying to think of what they would do in that position if you're thinking like your characters. Um, I think they're both creative, they're both work. It just depends on where you fall in uh, left and right brains. And um, the ones who are a bit more right-brained go, oh, let's turn it loose. And the ones who are a bit more left-brained say, I'd like it more structured. And for me, the structure begins with where are we going to start this story? So we started Panama's Gold during the time of the French excavating the canal. And we ended it in 2018. And I insisted I knew where was the end state. Where were we going with the story? And then we can deviate along the way. We sort of had an outline, but it, we didn't follow it always. And we added things to it. And when I write on my own, I do the same thing. I, I can remember being in NaNoWriMo. So you, I, for those of you who don't write, that's the National Novel Writing Month. And the first year I participated, I wrote, I wrote the first day for 16 hours. And somewhere, somewhere about two o'clock in the morning on the first day, I was writing, I knew what, what I was supposed to write in this next scene. And I decided to just let go. And I wrote something that I had not planned on. And I think it really enhanced the book. And so both approaches are good. Uh, the, the problem with people who relied totally on pantsing or, you know, just just sitting down and writing without knowing where they're necessarily going to go oh, is that there's a high, a high degree of those people not finishing a project. Whereas if I have at least a goal where I know where I'm going and a, sort of a path to get there, I'll get there eventually. And, but that works for me. So everybody's a little bit different. I think Anything you else have we... to have those two points. You have to have the beginning and the end. And because otherwise you really will not have a place to go. Um, right. Back when our children were little, our son would say, everybody has to be somewhere. But that's not really true. At this point, you can lose your characters because they don't know where they're going until you tell them. Okay. Um, we're going to just do a couple of acknowledgments to those people who, uh, who, uh, we need to thank, and then we'll open it up to questions and answers. Sandy, you want to start? Yes, I was just going to say um, part of what made our, our book wonderful were the illustrations that Yasmin did for us. And they are, mm, photographs are wonderful, but it's like the idea of building on that to do what an artist does. And there's this personality that comes through in those that is not necessarily there in a photograph. And Yasmin's illustrations enhanced our book tremendously. And I'm so grateful that she would do those for us. Um, and the other one I would like to thank is Bryn because talking to him and having him reassure us that what we were saying was right and then providing some extra expertise so that we knew that we could base some fiction on some actual things was not only reassuring it it gave it structure that we needed so those two are my guys and your acknowledgments Jim? yeah we we got some help from the albuquerque museum when it came to spanish armor because if we're gonna be digging up old Spanish gold and you're gonna probably find some bones and you're gonna find some armor from uh, the, the fellow who dies in the beginning of the book, 
And so uh, Deb Slaney from the Albuquerque Museum, our publisher, Sandy Larkin from Red Penguin Books. She believed in our story and, and published it. Uh, members of the Corrales Writing Group. And of course, our spouses, Richard and Yasmin, who get to read everything first. Sandra, you want to take it away for uh, questions yes. and answers? Yes, I'd like to welcome our audience <laughs> at this point to ask Jim and Sandy any questions you may have. I actually have a question if anyone's unmuting at this point. So Sandy, uh, did the previous story with Lonnie come from a birding trip also? The character Lonnie, did that come from the inspiration from a, one of your birding trips? No, actually that inspiration came from one of the original, well, the guy who was the origin of the Corrales writing group. Uh, he has just since passed away, but Don Wrightley used to fly hang gliders and he would leap off the Sandia mountains. And that as a, a retired balloon pilot, which I am, uh, mm -hmm. appealed to me as something really foolish. And so I thought, okay, that is an extreme. Let's have Lanny do that. And uh, instead of being content to be just a birder on the ground, she's going to be trying to see the birds from that vantage point in the air. And so that's what started that one. Thank you. And in that story, she sees what might be a murder. And in it, and she is also seen. And then there is the concern of, is she safe? Is she not? Is it a murder? How do you catch someone? More of an answer than you asked. <laughs> no, I appreciate all the input. I'm, I'm uh, anxious to read more of your stories. Does anyone else have questions at this time? Go ahead. I see a hand up. Go ahead and speak. Yeah, just I was just wondering. Uh, first of all, Jim, I should I failed to mention. I apologize. Thanks very much for the review of my book. I appreciate that. But my question is, did you ever consider starting the thing at the ending and working toward the ending? Is that ever a style that you might consider on a story? Uh, not in my writing with Sandy, but yes, I've used that approach on some of the things that I've written. Yeah. Uh, and I've done total pantsing, uh, un, un, you know, Sandy cast me as the organized, the organized person, but I've sat down there and just let the stuff flow. And if you do that, if you know, if you're, if you're actually starting at the end, I know where I'm going to end up with this. And then it just flows out and there's no organization whatsoever, but that's a, that's more to me, that works better in a short story. I, I think flash writing, it lends itself or works best as shorter things. Yeah, and Sa Sandy, you and I and Yasmin and some of the other people from the Corrales Writing Group, we've gone uh, on these little uh, train rides in from Albuquerque to Santa Fe where you have one hour and uh, maybe an hour and 15 minutes and you get a writing prompt when you get on the train, you write on the train and when you get out, you, get, you, go, to the, you go to a coffee shop and you all read what you wrote. So yeah, there's no wrong way to write in my opinion. There's just lots of different ways and I use them all. That and lots of revising. That's the yes. other piece of it. Once you've got something on paper, then you can work to make it better or make it the best you can manage. Um, it gives you somewhere to start once you've got something down and then you can enhance or enlarge or subtract, lots of subtracting. I think we dazzled them. No more questions. <laughs> no, somebody's got to have a question. <laughs> so Michael, have go ahead, Michael. You're muted. There, there we go. What parts of the whole process do you enjoy most? And what parts of the process do you not enjoy? Oh, Jim, I'll let you start. No, you go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> what part do I not like? Uh, what part do I like most? Um, I think watching a character develop is the most fun. Where you say, okay, 
uh, it started out a little two dimensional and now I can see that I'm adding characteristics that make this person more real, mm -hmm. more alive. Um, and the part I like least, hunting for all of the repetitious words. <laughs> hmm. Going through this careful process of tightening up a sentence. Does it say exactly what you want? Can you make it better? Can you make it? <laughs> I, I love him. I'm, he's so cute. Sorry, I'm <laughs> sidetracked by the gray. Yeah, I know. <laughs> anyway, those are mine. What are yours, Jim? So I, I also don't like the tail, the, the tail end when you're we're having to get the commas right and the grammar right and all that. I, I despise that. I do it, but I don't like to do it. I like plotting out. I like the conceptual stage. This was true for me at work also, where I would, I loved to work for an admiral who had no idea what the hell he wanted to do, but he'd say, I, I, I kind of like you to do something here. And I'd go find a blank screen and a blink, blinking cursor. That's all I need. So I love that front end of developing a project and then setting goals now. So there's the organizational part. All right, so when the people put this book down, I want them to, and then I'll have a whole series of things that I go, this is what I want the reader to come walk away with at the end of the story. And there's always a point in my, in when, in my writing. There's a reason I have done it the way I have done it. It's, it's carefully, it, it may be the last sentence before the whole, story is put together and if i can succeed in doing that i love it i if if it's a humorous piece and i take it down to the va writing group on on thursday and i can take and make a bunch of veterans who are combat wounded and make them laugh i am thrilled because that's probably the only laugh they'll get that whole week so i i enjoy writing and it's all your fault judy we started back in Gorton High School, and I have just—I've never stopped writing ever since then. <laughs> Jude, I'm—I'm I'm really looking forward to um, reading this Indiana Jonesy type book. It sounds really exciting. And uh, we love you both. And just interested in how, I, do you two have background in writing? And also, how did you know you two would be able to write well together? And, <laughs> and how long did it take you to write this book? OK, I'll start. Um, the first thing that we wrote together happened because, and Maureen can talk about this as well, the writing group did an exercise. We decided to try writing as teams. And so we all wrote down a prompt and then we threw them in the hat and we chose teams that the person who wrote that idea could not be on that team. So we all had something fresh to work from and there were teams of two and teams of three, and we wrote a whole series of different stories. And Jim and I enjoyed writing together and it kind of stuck. Um, and how did we discover that we collaborated well? It was during that first experimental attempt when we didn't kill one another and the words turned out okay. <laughs> More to add? Yeah, I've been writing in, te in teams ever since I was I worked for the government. I worked for 44 years and I wrote the entire time I was uh, working for the government. And I very I, I sometimes wrote alone, but I often wrote with other people. And, and anybody who's worked for the government understands how that works. You just you're part of a team. It's a collective project. And, and you so you had to learn how to get along with people. And, and I've given talks about writing. And one of the things I, I, use, I used in that talk is the example of write with another person because it's going to be better than if you do it by yourself. And the, the team I had in mind was somebody that uh, a team that worked in the Pentagon when I was there. One guy was brilliant. He absolutely he was the smartest guy on this subject that anybody knew. And he couldn't write his way out of a paper bag. The other guy knew how to write. 
And the two of them together put out some incredibly good stuff. So I knew, you know, that that writing as a team is not does not mean that you're you're not capable of doing it alone. It just means you're approaching it from a different perspective. Yasmin and I have written uh, a an award winning children's book, you know. So it, I I come naturally. In fact, I was looking the other day at and I uh, it's natural for me to have written in teams, and I have probably published ten or fifteen things with other people. Did we get all your your answers? The questions, uh, uh, Jude. Uh, Kathleen, go ahead. Oh, thank you. Uh, hi, Jim. Hi, Sandy. I'm, I'm very impressed on how you, I know you've answered some of these questions on how you work together, but I guess on fiction, what I'd like to know, does Sandy take a chunk and then does Jim take a chunk or does you take one chapter, Jim take another? How, how do you, how do you weave your work in? Hmm. I'll take it. Go ahead. So there's no wrong answer to that. It's all of the above. So in the middle of writing this book, Sandy had some, some uh, family emergencies come up. So I just stepped in and, and did a little bit more than, you know, was my turn, but it didn't matter. It was just, sort of, it was a placeholder. It was like, okay, well, I'll just keep moving the story along here. When she gets, when she's not busy, she'll come back to it. So sometimes she'd be the lead. Sometimes I'd be the lead. If it's birding, she was the lead. The flying scenes, I was the lead, but it, it didn't matter. It, it, we, we both were able to do that. And if I was busy and I couldn't handle it, then Sandy would write that, that particular portion. Same thing when I, when I worked with, with Yasmin, you know, we both worked on the story together. And then of course she did all of the illustrations. And so I can't do that. So, you know, it's, it's a compliment. Judy, was that the way it was in high school? Or did you, did you just let me run everything? <laughs> <laughs> well, and I lost the thought I was, gonna, was going to mention, but it was, again, the idea that whoever felt comfortable writing about that part took over and, and, it just, and then filled in wherever else. And, and we also knew that the other person would know more about a particular subject. So, for example, if we had a scene and a, a bunch of, of ladies were going to go into the ladies' room, how in the hell could I write that? I don't even know what goes on in there, right? And similarly, uh, there was a scene in, a, in another, in a previous uh, collaboration in which a couple of guys went into a bar. And the way the okay. language was... Um, kind of surprised Sandy you know she said no 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 my Richard wouldn't say that and I looked at her and I said yes he would if you weren't there yeah that's you know it was it was in in this way um a seamless because whoever felt comfortable doing it wrote it yeah uh, and the other the other piece of that is that if you're going to write this way you leave your ego at the door because you have to allow the other person the grace of doing what they can do and not feel like, oh my God, there went my, my baby words that I can't stand having cut out of the page. But I, but I think that's true in any writing. Whoever it was who said, kill your darlings was right. You have to be harsh about what you're going to accept as the, what you want to put out there as writing. Yes. that answer you, Kathleen? Yes, but I'm still impressed. I'm still <laughs> impressed that I, I've got some other, some friends that have been co-authoring. They're in New Mexico, Sue Baggio and Mira. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, we know them. I met them at Southwest Writers in 1998 when it was at the Marriott a long time ago. But I know they've been writing together since they were like teenagers. I'm still, I'm just always in awe of people who can, write together so thank you so much this has been very enjoyable and i'm proud of you I, I have to say this was my first time of sharing writing because up until now my stuff has been journaling or writing what i'm seeing when i'm on birding trips i i start out keeping really good diaries and then i get tired because you're going from before dawn till after dark and i'm just and then i go okay well that story died you know or that or that trip 
you got halfway through it this time. That's pretty good. And, you know, the rest of the time, I just uh, try and remember what basically happened. Uh, it's always been watercolor illustrations to go along with small stories that I'm writing about trips. So you're, what I'm hearing, Sandy, is that with Jim as your co-author, you all keep each other accountable. Yeah, it's a good way yeah. of thinking of it. Number one, you have to do it. And, and number two, you have to participate in the collaboration to make it work. And we had the support of a, of a local writing group with uh, seven people in it. And that was pretty, that was pretty important too, because we got, we would be satisfied with something that we wrote. Our spouses would, you know, pr listen to us, read it, or they would read, they would look at it. And then I'd take it to, and then I'd take it to the VA and on Thursday mornings, I read this entire book chapter by chapter and, and heard, that was a good technique. You know, I heard what it sounded like. And then I went, oh, that sounds terrible. And I'd make corrections and I'd get feedback from some of the veterans and the volunteers that were there. And that was important. And then the next step was to take it to the Corrales writing group where we did a review of, you know, this is just the story. Don't give me the grammar. I just want to look at, you know, is this flowing well? and then go back in and really take a look at the story and get the nuts and bolts right. And then a third go through by ourselves where we're doing the despicable stuff like the commas and the grammar and the spelling and all that. You know, that's not a lot of fun, but that's gotta be done. Does anyone else have questions or comments? I'd like to thank you both for being here tonight. And Mirth and Musings and Panama's Gold are available to purchase at Amazon.com. I shared the link in the chat, but they're also available in our collection at the Corrales Community Library. And I have to say, as, as soon as I processed them, uh, they were checked out. So uh, you may have to place a hold if you want to read, the, read them. Uh, you, know, you can read them when they're returned to the library because they are both checked out. Um, The other places I've, they are going to be at Organic Books after this weekend, and we're still looking at a couple of places in town. That's right. Or we'll, the copies will be at Organic Books um, at uh, on Saturday afternoon when I deliver them. <laughs> Other than that, uh, go to Amazon.com and have at it. And can I say something as, a, as an author myself? Please yeah. do. Please, please write reviews. Oh, yes. Where do I send the check by? <laughs> <laughs> hey, thanks, you two. Congratulations. Yeah. You. Uh, if you, if you yeah. liked what we talked about, there's a, a podcast that will be broadcast, I think, on, on Wednesday, October the 13th, uh, with uh, a lady, a retired, an emeritus professor up in Farmington, and, uh, which is in New Mexico for all of you East Coast folks. And uh, I will have it posted, and so will Sandy, on our Facebook pages, so you can just click on something and listen to it. It's an hour-long interview. Uh, it's got some, some different perspectives because we were answering questions. Oh, it's a half an hour. That's right. It's only half an hour. Uh, but uh, that, that's available also. Thank you all for coming this evening. It was fun to see all the new faces. And thanks, Thank Sandra. Thank you very Thank much. You it was us. wonderful. Well, thank you yeah, all for being you. here tonight. I sure am, am pleased to have you all join us for our author series and uh, come back next month where we'll be speaking with Ben, ben Radford. Oh, thank wonderful. You. Yeah, Good thank day. you, Jim, and thank you, Sandy, and thank you, everyone, for attending. Good night. Good night. Good night. Nice Good night. seeing everybody. Bye-bye. See you, Jim. Good night. Bye.